Quantum computing currently is at a very interesting transition point. Here at USC, we're pretty much on the cutting edge of quantum computing. We have a large number of faculty who are involved in, in the field. Uh, we have a, a large activity funded by IARPA uh, under the Quantum Enhanced Optimization Program, where we are setting out to build our own 100 qubit quantum annealer in, in five years in collaboration with uh, MIT Lincoln Labs. We have two very active centers where people are working on all aspects of quantum information science, including quantum computing, quantum cryptography, quantum communication. The USC Quantum Computing Center is uh, aimed at two important things. One is to understand the fundamentals of quantum devices, their limitations, and what the power is, and how to exploit that power. The other line of research is try to understand how that power can be used for certain applications of important problems for real-world applications. One of the topics that I find particularly interested in, in quantum computing is the interface between theory and experiment. Uh, when I got into this field uh, more than 20 years ago, it was almost entirely theoretical. Uh, ever since, I've been driven by a desire to uh, make sure that uh, we move from a purely theoretical enterprise into a practical realization uh, of quantum computation. I mean, we're getting closer in the experimental part. They're building devices and actually, I mean, you will think where well, you're building a device that you don't know if it's gonna have any power. That's correct. But on the other hand, well, if you don't build it and try it, you're never gonna know if it has something new or not. We're very fortunate uh, to have access to the one and only academic installation of a D-Wave machine. If you look at the D-Wave machine, it looks like a big black box. If you could open up the door and go inside of the D-Wave machine, you'd see a big cylinder about the size of a water heater. That's the dilution refrigerator that keeps the working part of the quantum computer just a few millikelvin above absolute zero. There's a big arm that goes down inside that, that contains the electronic control lines. And then the working part of the D-Wave computer is a chip about yay big. So that's the part that's really the computer. Everything else is just the apparatus that makes it all work. Our group uh, uses uh, D-Wave machine for some of our research. Quantum annealing uh, as a algorithm for optimization has faced a lot of objections uh, in the last years. Uh, one of those objections uh, being uh, using the phenomenon called many-byte localization to argue that quantum annealing will never work. There was a lot of skepticism of whether these type of devices will really generate the necessary quantum effects for any kind of speed up during quantum computation. So it was very important to try to understand if entanglement was present in this device. We were very happy to find a particular experiment in which we look at the system of eight qubits, but we were able at that level to do measurements and prove that there was entanglement generated in the system. And that was very important. The biggest barrier to building a quantum computer is decoherence or, or quantum noise. Uh, if errors happen in the course of a computation, they can derail the results. Quantum error correction is, is necessary uh, f in order for quantum computers to, to scale up. Uh, my team and I have uh, come up with ideas for how to implement quantum error correction. We've tested them on the D-Wave machines, and, and to our great delight, uh, we were able to show that the experiments that we then uh, performed on the D-Wave machines bore out the theoretical predictions, and we were actually able to improve the performance of these relatively noisy processors. As our technology advances, we have to deal with quantum effects for everything. I mean, your phone, the engineering of your phone depends on quantum mechanics. And I think the more people can understand fundamentally how things work on a quantum level, the better they'll be at engineering stuff on a quantum level. It's hard to visualize a quantum process because quantum mechanics doesn't take place in the usual three dimensions of space, but in a high dimensional abstract space. That's why I made quantum chess to let people get hands on with it and give everyone an opportunity to interact with something that can give them a feel for concepts like superposition or entanglement or interference and what those mean physically. 
this point in time, uh, we are at a juncture where finally we have quantum computing systems that are sufficiently sophisticated and sufficiently large that we believe we can start to do non-trivial things with them. That's what I think the near future of quantum computing is going to be. A lot of effort of trying to understand these devices are small, they're noisy, but they're quantum. So how can we take that and extract some kind of advantage for a particular application. If this works out, this opens up an enormous range of new kinds of problems that quantum computers might be able to usefully tackle. Um, that's one of the major motivations of the Quantum Computing Center. We expect that quantum computers will be able to solve the Schrodinger equation much faster than is possible on, on classical computers. Uh, and this will have applications in quantum chemistry, in simulating correlated electron systems. Then you get things like AI and machine learning and everything. I mean, medicine, it's, it's going to change how the world works.